Hello everyone, uh, my name is Samar Razavi and I'm very much excited to welcome you to the first lecture of this year uh, Distinguished Lecture Series on Water Security Research. I would also like to welcome our simulcast viewers, uh, in particular the students in Beijing Normal University in China who are participating in our joint master program uh, for water security. So for the simulcast viewers, uh, if you have questions for any researcher this week on the following weeks, please make sure to email me before the end of the lecture. I'll do my best to uh, read them out loud for the speaker and get an answer, of course, if time permits. Uh, yeah, and for our students in Master for Water Security program here on campus, there's a sign-up sheet. I've put it there. Please make sure to write your name. So a little bit of history at the beginning. So we started this lecture series back in 2013, and this is actually our seventh year running this, and time flies. I've been here for all of it. All the videos of the talks have been professionally video, uh, videotaped and available on our YouTube channel, USASC GIWS, uh, and some of which already have received thousands of views. I just checked them last night. That's amazing for science outreach. Uh, and I think for those, uh, it behooves me to thank Jeff McDonald for his vision in the first place to put this thing together, and now he's passing it on to me to run. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, Jay Familietti and Global Institute for Water Security, and John Pomeroy and the Global Water Future Program for underwriting this seminar series and providing logistics and support. So it's indeed a great pleasure this week to welcome Professor Reed Maxwell to Saskatoon. Reed is a professor at the Department of Geology and Geological Engineering, Colorado School of Mine, and the director of the Integrated Groundwater Modeling Center. He received his PhD in Civil and Environmental Engineering from the University of California, Berkeley. And after a couple of years as postdoc in Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, he joined Colorado School of Mine in 2000 as a faculty member. Reed has been a leader in the field of computational hydrology. Many of us have come across his model, Powerflow, which is an amazing, very rigorous model for surface and subsurface flow. And interestingly, this model is becoming amazingly comprehensive, integrating many different components, including land surface and now more recently water management and so I've been hearing interesting stuff on optimization coupled with this model for basically pumping and also hopefully there's going to be a new component added in the near future on reservoir operation and diversions. Yeah, I personally found his research work very interesting because he does both experimental and computational hydrology and he tries to bridge really the two worlds of uh, uh, being out there in the field and do a lot of computer modeling uh, for, uh, uh, for someone like myself who is always sitting in the office. Uh, he's been fairly uh, very active in research and has published more than 120 peer-reviewed journal papers. And uh, since last evening, we have had a lot of interesting conversation around a lot of common research interests that with his research group and Global Institute for Water Security Community in general. And in particular interesting to me is his work on global sensitivity analysis and water management and basically integration of the different models. Uh, so Reed is a decorated researcher with several awards and most recently he's the latest recipient of the Darcy Lecture Award in 2020 and soon he's going to begin his touring around the world and he was telling me that he is, is planning to give 50 talks, 5-0 talks, different places around the world and if we're lucky we can get him again here in the next year for a Darcy lecture. And also just past few weeks he's been a, a, a elected fellow of American Geophysical Union and uh, so, uh, so I heard this basically as part of my involvement in AGU administration, now hydrology section. So congratulations, Reed, on such prestigious recognitions. So with this, it's a real pleasure to welcome you, Reed, to Saskatoon. Please give me in giving him a warm welcome. Wow. Uh, thank you all very much. There's 
room down front. Um, I don't know that I've ever given a standing only talk. I'm a little bit nervous. Um, so I'm Reed Maxwell. Thanks for the great introduction. And thanks for all the terrific meetings and such that we've had today. Um, I'm going to talk about some kind of big picture stuff, which I call scientific discovery through computational hydrology. And then I'm going to talk about some specific work that I've been do doing kind of myself that's a somewhat of a pet project around understanding how much transpiration happens and how transpiration partitioning is affected by different processes. So just to set the stage, and I think this is going to resonate very well with this audience, you know, we have really large scale challenges in water and they're only getting bigger. Um, there's a great image from some of Petra Dahl's work. This is the early versions of the water gap model showing groundwater depletions. Um, and if we think about the other side of the land surface, this is some work that appeared in Science, some of the early remote sensing Google Earth engine work on understanding not only the land cover, but also changes in land cover um, over North America. And we have tools to try to understand these challenges and try to understand these systems, but we also have really large gaps. And I love this example because at one end we have this is an image of GRACE, the first GRACE, but we have GRACE follow-on, two satellites that, because of the changes in position of the two satellites, we observe changes in the gravity vector, and we can infer changes in water storage over the column, mostly due to groundwater. GRACE is an amazing remote sensing product on the scale of a degree to a couple degrees in terms of scale. We jump to our in-situ measurements of groundwater. We have groundwater wells, which are also extremely important. And groundwater wells are seeing something on the order of centimeter to meter scale. And the scale discrepancy between these two types of ways to monitor these big changes in our Earth's available water is just astronomical. And coupled with that, we have the need, and this is a quote from a paper that Martin led um, in 2015 in the 2015 uh, special issue, the 50th anniversary issue of Water Resources Research. We have a critical need to represent these hydrologic processes explicitly and mechanistically, not empirically. And the idea is that we want to move our system forward. We want to move our understanding, not only for these big challenging problems, but also to do this in a more rigorous way. So we have kind of this idea of these different scales at which these challenges occur and at over which um, our decisions are made. And we can think about, obviously my bias, we have the area of the contiguous US down to sort of the individual crop, right? So roughly 8 million square kilometers down to about a square meter. We have farmers making decisions at the small scale. We have national planning, sort of at this continental scale. We have our major aquifers that bridge scales. And we have our surface and irrigation product projects, which are sort of in the middle. And one of the governing questions for me is that what scales do we need to consider to answer these questions? And if we think about one of the main ways to bridge these scales, Models are one of our main tools to bridge this meter scale at our direct observation, say of groundwater, to the very large scale, say remote sensing products. And we really have kind of a choice in terms of modeling. If we think about hydrologic modeling, hydrologic modeling systems, there's really different approaches. And we have kind of traditional land surface models, which simplify our processes, but can be incredibly efficient. And then on the other end of the spectrum, we have integrated hydrologic models, which can be very comprehensive, but are very computationally expensive. And the question is, which is, which is the right model? How do we decide what's the right approach? And one of the tools that we have is model inner comparison. And it's important because we want to understand when does the simple model provide a good enough answer, and when do we really need the additional complexity and how do we know what's our framework for how we know what this right amount of complexity is and this is some work that um, 
Stefan Collard led in uh, the workshop actually happened around 2015, but the paper was published in Water Resources Research. This was the second of two integrated hydrologic model in a comparison workshops um, and two papers. I led the first one, Stefan led the second one. And in these workshops, we really wanted to set up a set of benchmark problems where we brought together a community of integrated hydrologic modelers to really understand how our models performed and also to provide some measure of verification these very complex models, we don't have an analytical solution that bridges surface groundwater. We have analytical solutions for just components of these systems. So in the second, we also wanted to try to compare to more simplified models with these benchmark problems and increasing complexity. And what I think is important about this, and the exact case is not necessarily um, so critical, and the exact series of models is not necessarily so critical. I've taken all the um, all the identifiers off. But what you see is that we see some models grouping together, getting similar. This is outlet discharge for a particular problem. And we see some models diverging in behavior. And we see these organizing in terms of complexity. And I think a takeaway is that it's not always the case that the simpler model diverges from the more complex model. But we are seeing cases where the simpler models do diverge from the more complex models, which means that we start to understand how we get the right answers for the right reasons um, and not the right answers for the wrong reasons. So I um, use and develop, as, as someone mentioned, um, the integrated hydrologic model Parflow. We have a cartoon of what Parflow does. Um, there's a lot of words. There's going to be equations on the next slide. Hang with me. Um, we solve. 3D variably saturated groundwater flow everywhere. We solve a 3D form of the mixed, Richards, mixed form of the Richards equation. We have what we call fully integrated surface water flow. And the integrated, integrated means a lot of things to a lot of people. Integrated in this context does not mean water management. Integrated in this context means that we're solving the shallow water equations and 3D Richards equation in a globally implicit manner. So we're solving these equations together, which is very challenging, two nonlinear equations. But we're solving them together so that we can make sure we capture these interactions between these two systems. We also have coupled land service processes in um, with a version of CLM or originally common, now community land model. And this allows for a lot of interactions and connections. And this is a lot of what we use this model for. As I mentioned, um, we solve with a, a terrain following grid. So there's a cartoon here. We solve the mixed form of the Richards equation. We solve, um, we collapse the shallow water equations into what we call a free surface boundary condition um, and the Neumann type boundary condition. We have plugs for sources and sinks, and then we have a terrain following formulation for Richards equation. Now, as I alluded, this is an incredibly hard problem to solve. And we use a lot of both computer science and applied mathematic, uh, mathematics approaches to make this problem more tractable. So Parflow was designed to be parallel from the ground up using an object-oriented framework. We also use uh, newton kreloff not linear approach. So it's globally implicit. This is the integrated piece. We have um, a multi-grid preconditioned linear solver using the hyper package. Both of these packages come out of Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. And then on top of that, we used physics-based preconditioning, um, which effectively says that we use a lot of very sophisticated applied mathematical approaches to make a very hard problem slightly less hard to solve. In terms of the scaled parallel efficiency, and this is going to be very important for the work that I um, am going to show, we have demonstrated, for example, this is Uqueen, which was a, at one point was one of the fastest supercomputers in the world. And both in my experiments, we've run out to say 16 to 17,000 processors and, and problem sizes in the billion to tens to hundreds of billions. And this is some of uh, Stefan's group's work where they scaled to almost half a million processors with good scaled parallel efficiency. So we have as many tools as we can to sort of pull all of these different systems together. Now, this is good because we have a lot going on in the PARflow system. And we try to maintain a lot of these interactions. And we've coupled to a lot of different 
codes. It's a community, uh, open source community software package. And, you know, Parflow has been called. It's been, the, it's been the driver for a lot of different packages and a lot of different experiments. Okay. So, in my group, uh, we study a range of topics. And a central theme, as someone pointed out, is that I have a, a number of approaches to bridge scales. And this, for example, this is proof. I took this picture. Um, this is a Eddy Flex Tower that we have in the East River, Colorado. So this is uh, basically in the Upper Gunnison uh, Basin above Crested Butte. And we have a Eddy Flex Tower installed that, of course, we're making um, direct estimates of ET and CO2 flux. We have a high resolution model. This is a 10 meter resolution model of the East River Basin. And we can see that the Eddy Flux Tower is a few, it's a decent number of pixels, but still just a few pixels in this 10 meter resolution model, which the 10 meter resolution model is a small square in the whole CONUS modeling system. And we see that we can use observations, local scale process models, high resolution models to inform our coarser resolution but still large scale models. And we can use this to try to understand connections between the system, between our hydrologic system. Now, one thing that I advocate for is that models can be really useful tools to provide insight. And I, and I'll talk about this in my examples, I advocate controlled numerical experiments to try to elucidate process interactions under change. And what I mean by that is we have these complicated numerical models, and we can use them in, experimental, in an experimental format that's very similar that if you had a field manipulation or you had a lab experiment. We can say, take a single perturbation. Let's say we keep everything constant, but we change temperature in a system. And we track all of these changes through this entire nonlinear system, looking for connections and insight into how our mathematical conceptualization of the system responds to change and tells us about connections within that may or may not be present in our physical system that we can use to guide observations. Okay, so my own work um, that I'm gonna talk about or focus on today has focused on large scale simulations over the continental US to get at a pretty basic question of how much water do trees and plants transpire? Now, this is a question that a lot of people are working on, um, including some people that were here. So estimating transpiration partitioning is a, is a really big challenge um, in hydrology. For one is that ET is the largest terrestrial water flux. More water moves between the land surface and the atmosphere than flows in rivers and streams. And there are a lot of estimates, they're evolving estimates of ET or T over ET, so our transpiration over our total evapotranspiration ratio, which is important because transpiration is also water that does work for us, if you will, if you think about the blue water, green water, of the green water, right? Transpiration is water that plants use to photosynthesize. And so it's water that we care more about that change. Now, our estimates are sort of converging from ice topic and other, other approaches to about 60%. So 60% of our transpiration of our total evapotranspiration is made up of transpiration. Yet, models continually struggle to represent this. And this is a paper by Schlesinger and Jacecko. Um, of course, Jacecko was here for a short time, of not only local scale, so these ecozone estimates of ET, and some of the earlier isotopically based um, estimates, but also some pretty common model estimates. And what we see is that there's some agreement between our stand scale estimates of ET. There's some agreement, there's better agreement with the later, more 62% isotopic estimates. But the models are really struggling to represent this transpiration to evapotranspiration ratio. And one of the hypotheses I had was that we can use these high resolution models at very large scale to try to bridge these feedbacks and bridge these connections. So another reason that I think it's important is that I maintain that groundwater is really underappreciated in this whole system. 
So we have a range of paths of scales in groundwater. Water physically moves via Darcy's law at a very slow rate, but pressure can move several orders of magnitude faster. Our pressure propagation in the subsurface system can happen very fast. And this represents a system that's been well documented to respond over a wide range of scales. We have Jim's work, we have Roy's work, um, Anders, Bayani, some of the work that I've done, really has shown that we get this really wide range of responsive scales. Um, this is some of Roy's work, which I like a whole lot. This is um, in a hyperreic system in a, st in a single string stream reach. Note this is time seconds in log scale. This is a dilution experiment where Roy sees a very clear power law tail, not the commonly used exponential function for hyperreic turnover time. This is Jim's work from his Nature paper in 2000. This is a larger system. This is wavelength, so this is um, one over frequency and against spectral power. And we see a gamma distribution here, not an exponential or advection dispersion as is commonly used. And so there's plenty of cases where we see this well-documented complex response from simple inputs and often groundwater is thought to be the moderator of the culprit. So high resolution modeling at large scale, continental to global scale, um, has been sort of a movement in the hydrologic modeling community. Eric Wood kind of kicked this off with the hyper-resolution, first hyper-resolution workshop. Um, Mark Birkins has kind of taken over the, the helm on this and has had follow-up workshops. There's been a lot of work on you know, this large-scale hyper-resolution everywhere and locally relevant. So everywhere in extent, but locally relevant. So if we were going to use a model, a numerical experiment over the continental US to try to understand bridge these gaps in transpiration partitioning, what are, what are sort of approaches? Well, we could try the simple model approach, which has been done quite a bit. Lots of land service models, lots of hydrologic models have been run continental to global at high resolution, um, which would be sort of our reduced or simplified physics. We could run at coarse spatial resolution, or we could use our powerful solvers, our good uh, scaled parallel performance, and what I like to call a big sledgehammer, our HPC, our, our big machine, to try to solve the system at high resolution using high performance computing. So that's what we did. And this work spans a couple of papers. This is work that was done with Laura Condon at University of Arizona and Stefan Collette, who's at the Research Center in Eulish and University of Bonn. So we built a proof of concept, 6.3 million square kilometer domain, covers much of the CONUS. We have one kilometer lateral resolution. We have variable vertical resolution um, up to 102 meter depth. It's really not that big. It's 32 million unknowns, which I was showing you, you know, tens of billion unknown problems. So 32 million unknowns is, is somewhat tractable. We wanted, as this proof of concept, to encompass the entire Mississippi and Colorado River watersheds. And remember, this is fully integrated, so we're solving 3D Richards equation, shallow water equations, and land surface processes. Now, the first question is, uh, how are you going to populate the data needs for this type of a model? Everybody's nodding their head, yes. So one of the things that we really wanted to do, is this is proof of concept, is we wanted to use as many off-the-shelf data products as we could. And land cover and soil are actually pretty straightforward. There's really you know, we debate about the, the resolution, we debate about the fidelity. Um, you know, Danny Orr has been, been telling us we should probably pull together better soil um, observations and better, better Peter transfer functions. But in general, these are not the hard part of that data need. The subsurface is a really challenging one. And what I did was we used, for this first, we used an early version of Glimpse, um, which is the Tom Gleason product as a, the GRL 2011 paper. He's got a couple more recent versions of this. And we did the model spin up in two ways. So the first thing we did is we built the model with these data sets, topography, etc. We developed a P minus ET product. We started the system dry and we ran it to steady state. Then we used transient forcing from NLDAS2 for the most average water year, which is 1985 over the over the record for average for precip and temperature over the continental US, which is actually kind of a challenging bar. 
and spun the system up. So what do we get? This is groundwater, daily average. So I'm just showing you 365 snapshots over the water year. So we start the beginning of the water year. In October, we run to the end of the water year. And this is water table depth roughly in log scale. This is half a meter. This is 50 meters. And one of the first things we notice is rapid response of shallow groundwater to precipitation events. We see lots of response. We see roughly following precipitation. Now, if we relax from sort of the, the shiny object that immediately captures our attention, and we look at the mountains, and you focus on the mountains, particularly during the snowmelt period, you actually see quite a bit of seasonal response happening. And so you see a wide range of scales and time periods over which these processes are occurring. Now, we can jump to a much higher frequency and important for land surface, latent heat flux. Now, at first glance, latent heat flux looks crazy. But that's mostly because the first thing you see is you see the response to daily average radiation, which is cloud cover. And so you see big response to cloud cover. But again, bless you, if you look at more seasonal trends, we actually see warming up and greening up happening over the continent. And you see patterns that really have a strong topographic, and we suspected strong groundwater-induced influence. So what this represents is sort of this proof of concept, transient simulation. As I mentioned, we drove it by NLDAS2 forcing. We ran water year 85, hourly resolution, so full ener energy budget. Um, and uh, full transients. This took roughly half a million core hours on Yellowstone, which has now been replaced by a faster supercomputer, but it took about 400,000 CPU hours, which on 2,000 processors is about a week of wall clock time. It's a big problem, but it's actually not a crazy problem. What is pretty amazing or intractable about this is that one year is 12 terabytes of model output and three terabytes of input. And this represents over 1.3 trillion output points. Now, 1.3 trillion output points, we pulled together as many validation data sets as we could over this water year, which between Snowtel, USGS stream gauges, and wells, was 1.2 million comparison points, which is a lot, right? 1.2 million comparison points over a year is, is not too bad, but that's still orders of magnitude fewer than our output. And one of the things that we really wanted to do, and I'm showing the comparison points here, we did a you know, comprehensive comparison in the SI of our, of our paper that came out in Science a couple years ago. I'm going to focus in on just the US stream gauge comparison. Everything is in the SI. Um, and I'm going to focus in a little bit differently on our philosophy. And what I mean by that is we wanted to think about this comparison to observations as a way to understand sources of model bias. And you can think about comparison to observations for a lot of reasons, but this is a completely uncalibrated model. We built this data sets. We did not, we did not estimate any parameters. We left everything as is completely uncalibrated model. And we did that for a reason, because we wanted to try to understand sources of bias, for example, for say stream flow, timing and volume, or groundwater depth, or SWE, not just to our model parameters, say, or the model formulation, but to all of the things that go into this type of a simulation. We have meteorological forcings, right? We have our scenario. This is, we have basically no water management in, in this simulation. We have high resolution, but topography is fractal. So no matter how fine your resolution is, you're always losing information about topography. That impacts your DEM, that impacts your stream network, that impacts a lot of different pieces. Then we have our model input parameters, our Manning's hydraulic conductivity, our 
not just our hydraulic connectivity, but our description of the hydrogeology, our simplification of the hydrogeology, and for example, different plant parameters. So we used a range of metrics, and I'm showing one that uh, Laura Condon came up with this. I call this the Condon diagram. Um, and what this is, is this is a two-dimensional metric. So it's volume bias plotted against Spearman's row. Spearman's row is a statistical timing. So this is daily for 3,000 stream gauges. So we're looking at the ability of the gauges to match just in terms of time and our ability to capture the correct volume bias. And we divided this into four quadrant, quadrants. We have our correct volume and correct timing or good, good hydrograph shape and our correct volume, which we've plotted as green here. And that's roughly half of our uh, observation locations. We have our correct volume, but incorrect timing, which we've plotted as purple here, which is roughly 30%. And then we have about 10% each of correct timing, but bad volume, and incorrect timing and incorrect volume. Now, there's a lot of different ways you could look at this. And you could say, well, all right, 50% green. Your model's half right or your model's half wrong. But I think that really underestimates understanding where the sources of bias are and where in this, thinking of this as a hydrologic system, we want to most improve. One of the nice things about this is that we can now plot this spatially. So these are the spatial gauge locations, colored again, so green, correct timing and correct volume, purple, correct volume, incorrect timing, blue, correct timing, incorrect volume, and red, both incorrect timing and volume. Now why is this important? Well, one of the things that we see is we see most of the East Coast most of the more humid regions actually do quite well. Could be for a lot of reasons. Could be the forcing is better. Could be it's more convective. Could be the way that um, topography interacts. There's a host of reasons. We see along our headwaters, along the Rockies, actually along a lot of our headwaters, we also do pretty well which is interesting because a lot of people would say, well, one kilometer resolution, you're going to not catch headwater representation very well at all. And it actually turns out to not be the case. However, what you see really clearly is as you move down the Colorado River, a lot of these greens turn to purple. Well, it's one of the most heavily managed systems in the US, but probably the world as well. And so, of course, we're going to miss a lot of the changes in timing that happen with water management. The other thing is we also see areas, and I'm not showing this, but you'll have to just believe me, where we see biases in snow processes. So we see snow tell mismatch, and we see changes in our stream flow. And we can very easily attribute that to, say, the forcing in LDAS or, or the temperature bias with elevation. Now, the last thing I want to point out that's very interesting is we have, say, on the South Platte, we have areas where we go from green to purple, and then we go to red. And we see a lot of red over the high plains. And what's interesting about a lot of these red areas, this is mismatch in timing and in volume, is that the model actually overpredicts the gauge. We go from underpredicting the gauge to overpredicting the gauge. So hold that thought. So now, let's think about transpiration partitioning and let's think about connecting scales point to large scale observations. So what I've done, this is, these are density plots. This is transpiration as a function of total ET, zero to one. I have plotted each of the ecozones in the Schlesinger and Jusheko paper now as box and whisker diagrams as evergreen forests, deciduous forests, mixed forests, is roughly matching the ecozones with corresponding land cover types in Parflow CLM. So here we have our mixed forests, we have our deciduous forests, and our evergreen forests, and we're plotting them against our temperate and temperate deciduous forests. We also have, this is the Jusheko et al., as corrected by uh, Miriam Kinders, estimate of total uh, or global transpiration partitioning. 
This is Stephen Good's estimate, similar um, in approach. So these are our global estimates. These are our point scale estimates. And then these are our model simulations. And I've just plotted the, um, the median values here. And so we can see that we get really nice agreement between combinations of our small scale model estimates that we can upscale and our large scale values. So they gave us a lot of confidence that we're not just matching a few individual types of observations, we're also matching some behavior and we're matching some scaling behavior. So then what we did was we did a numerical experiment. And that numerical experiment was, let's run this like a traditional land service model. Let's turn off lateral flow. We can simplify our model, turn off lateral flow, and provide a free drainage condition at the bottom. Leave everything else constant. And so what we see now, when we look at transpiration partitioning, for our no lateral flow, so this is basically running just like CLM with a little bit deeper um, soil layer, we now see a systematic underestimation of our transpiration partitioning for our no lateral flow case. And in general, it's about 15%, but it varies across different land cover types. And so this was pretty interesting, and we really wanted to sort of understand if there might be a mechanism or what a theoretical underpinning of this might be. So we plotted latent heat flux versus water table depth, which I've done quite a lot before. I've shown here. These are for different, uh, these are for different soil types. Plotted bare soil evaporation and transpiration, both as functions of water table depth. And we see a much stronger relationship between transpiration and bare soil evaporation. And so what we did was we plotted T over E. So this is transpiration to bare soil evaporation, not transpiration to total evapotranspiration, to look for a logistic relationship between these two. And what we saw was a peak of about 40 times more transpiration than evaporation at kind of this critical depth, roughly a couple meters. And this allowed us to develop a conceptual model for why this might be. And our conceptual model, shown here, we have a very simple hill slope. The bottom of the hill slope, this is water table depth, just cartoon, so it's linear. We have shallow water at the bottom of our hill slope due to lateral flow, nobody's water limited. Transpiration and bare soil evaporation basically can happen at potential. At the top of the hill slope, everybody's water limited, and so everybody's dependent on antecedent moisture. Everybody's dependent on whatever rainfall increased soil moisture, whatever snow melt increased soil moisture, and then that, when that drains away or evaporates away, everybody shuts off. Now, in the so-called critical zone here, we have due to deeper plant water access due to the root system than our bare soil evaporation, we have evaporation shutting off faster than transpiration. And this creates this same logistical type relationship where we have a T over E ratio that would peak due to this difference. And so what's interesting about this is this actually has a lot of implications for plant water use strategy. That is that our model is suggesting that plants, and our model is a model, our model has, does not have living plants in it, of course. And so this suggests that plants are doing, accessing deeper sources of water under stress. And there's been some really interesting work that's come out um, in the last couple of years, both out of California CZOs, critical zone observatories, both due to the historic drought. And one is work out of Roger Bale's group, which is um, in the Providence CZO, the Southern Sierra CZO. And this is a plot, I'm gonna show a little bit more about this later. This is a plot before and during the drought. They had a flux tower going the entire time. And precip and runoff, both tank, ET barely changes at all. And they surmise in this paper that this is a big change in, in groundwater storage because plants were kept alive during the drought by accessing groundwater. And this is some work by, um, this is some work by Daniela Rempe at um, University of Texas. And what Daniela showed at the Eel River CZO was that plants there were using this 
rock moisture and the seasonal groundwater storage as sort of otherwise unconsidered sources of water. And I had a master's student recently who wanted to follow up on this among the many questions that my students are looking at. And so I'm going to touch on this work a little bit. It, can we use models like this to try to unravel these um, signatures? And so what Caitlin did was she built a model of the Southern Sierra CZO, which is shown here. This is California. Um, and here's the CZO, which is a cluster of different watersheds. And these are Caitlin's model results. So we've got 2011 plotted to look just like Rogers. In 2014, we have cumulative precip and cumulative discharge. And then we have ET. And she's plotted the ET from the 301 flux tower, from the flux tower that was in place. This is non-drought year. This is a drought year. And what we actually see is that we get really nice agreement without calibration between the observations of ET and the models and the change in ET during the drought. And would not be say, the same as what you get from a rem remote sensing input, which wouldn't have knowledge of groundwater. And so we can kind of zoom in on this, and what we see is that we see very similar trends between the two. And to dive into this more, Caitlin plotted same latent heat flux versus water table depth, bare ground evaporation, and transpiration. Red are drought years, blue are non-drought years. And what we see is we see actually a strengthening of our transpiration ratio or a transpiration dependence on water table depth during the drought because plants are even more dependent and our T over ET intensifies. So maybe additional piece of evidence. There's been a lot of other nice studies. This is work um, that Prabhakar Shrestha um, at the University of Bonn did in their catchment. Um, and then this is work that came out of the Himes CZO in Arizona, all looking for the same kind of under stress do we see these transpiration partitioning relationships. So this got me thinking about, can we use models like this to understand plant water use a little more directly? And this is the last piece that I'm going to talk about. Um, and this is some work that just came out, uh, well, it came out earlier this year in Ecohydrology Letters. And um, what this is is a demonstration of a code that we're calling EcoSlim. So what EcoSlim does is on top of a PARflow run, it uses a Lagrangian particle tracking approach, and it places particles into the domain that can be tracked in terms of age or source water or anything you want um, throughout the simulation. And it places particles in these demonstrations as rain, snow, or pre-existing groundwater. And ET removes particles from the domain over the root zone in a formulation that works a lot like a partially penetrating well in old sort of groundwater terms. And it's parallel, and it's actually based on some um, proof of concept work that Lindsay Barrup, a, another former PhD student of mine, did that was also published in Ecohydrology in 2016. So what does this look like and what does this do? So this is a hill slope simulation. This is just an example. This is actually um, forced with um, forcing that's mostly rain fed. So we have a buildup of particles. This is colored by particle source. So we see the pre-event groundwater gets washed out, if you will. We have just thin bands of snow and mostly rain in the system. And we can spin this system up over 20 years. We also can look at this um, in terms of evolution of groundwater age. This is the exact same simulation. This is mean particle age with time. And so we see a transience in the mean particle age of the domain. And we also see a broad distribution that evolves of particle age over our hill slope domain. Now, we can use this to try to understand differences between land cover type, and I have plots for trees and shrubs, which have different root depth profiles, and rain-fed and snowmelt-dominated systems. So ER is for East River. This is ER shrubs, ER trees. This is our snowmelt-dominated system. And then we have LW, which is for Little Washta, this is our rain-fed system. And we see differences in the behavior of these two systems. So for one, we see that trees result in older outflow residence times. 
And our rain-fed system generally has older outflow times than our snowmelt-dominated system. Although I think this is because it also has a different P-ET. Now, we can also introduce the concept of ET residence times. So these are the residence times of water of particles, ta particles that are tagging parcels of water as evapotranspiration happens. And we can look at, say, the East River shrubs or trees. We see that trees access older water, um, but that on average, and each of these are average over the domain, on average, everybody appears to be accessing this season's water or water that's less than one year old. And forcing seems to have less of an impact on ET residence time than it did for outflow residence time. And so I thought this was really interesting because it seems like that you know, trees should be using older sources of water than just one year. But this is an average over our hill slope of our ET residence time. And so what I did was I plotted ET residence time as a function of location along the hill slope. So now this is averaged over the year. This is the last year of the 20-year spin-up. And what we see is that at the bottom of our hill slope, where plants are in contact with groundwater, we have a much broader range, a much broader range of residence times, and plants are accessing much older water. Now, up at the top of the hill slope, where they don't have access to groundwater, they're forced to access much younger aged water, or at least in the model. So we can also do this at the entire catchment scale. This is work that's um, in collaboration with Lawrence Berkeley National Lab as part of their watershed science focus area. Um, and we can do numerical hydrograph separation in the same way that you might do um, chemical hydrograph separation. This is our fraction of, say, groundwater, snow, and rain in our outflow. This is our fraction of groundwater, snow, and rain in ET over the water year. And we see really different behaviors, right? And there's been a lot of work trying to observe these, and I think this makes a really nice complement to trying to also understand these. Okay, so talked about a lot of stuff, covered a lot of ground, but I feel like I'm presenting a step in our process towards understanding groundwater-fed ET processes. We see connections between our hydrology and land energy fluxes. Lateral flow is super important in this whole system. And I think as a bigger takeaway, it's really important to think about high resolution integrated model experiments as an additional tool in this whole system. And moving forward, right, I think we can solve these grand challenges. And one of the big things is I think we want to engage the community to use these different results. And so we have a roadmap on where we're going in our continental scale modeling framework. And we start out with sort of the GMD steady state, GM, uh, geoscience modeling development paper steady state. We move to our Parflow CLM. We start to increase, we call this CONUS 1.0. We increase, say, pumping, groundwater pumping, irrigation, looking for these connections. Then what we're doing now is what we're calling CONUS 2.0, which we've now expanded to the coastlines. Um, we're syncing up with the U.S. National Water Model, and we're adding much more in terms of process fidelity. So we're increasing resolution, increasing the extent, and adding more processes. And just as an example, um, this is a paper that just came out uh, that uh, Laura Condon published in Science Advances uh, earlier this summer. This is our now simulation of groundwater pumping as reconstructed over the past hundred years. And what Laura's work shows is that we see significant declines and even loss of some of our stream segments in our surface water system due to groundwater pumping. And the red dots that we saw where we were having an overprediction of our stream flow were, in fact, strongly due to the lack of a groundwater pumping signal. So the lack of this groundwater pumping signal and the reductions in flows that we see in this system really relate strongly to that source of bias. In addition for you know, being a way to sort of reconstruct and simulate the impact of groundwater on, on pumping. And so 
Another important piece in terms of community engagement, we have a National Science Foundation project called HydroFrame, um, which we're just kicking off. And this is a national scale modeling framework for both the Wharf Hydro as configured as the US National Water Model and Parflow Conus. Um, and this is gonna be a way to engage the community, a way to prov you know, provide results and, and a whole bunch of other pieces. And this is a really interesting collaboration between hydrologists and computer scientists. Um, and in that, just to sort of highlight kind of the CONUS 2.0, we have coastlines, we have improved subsurface representation, um, and you know, a lot more in terms of scope and process fidelity. So with that, thank you very much. Um, really appreciate the invitation, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thanks very much for such a great talk, and we have a mic here. So we have time for questions. Okay, just make sure to get the mic because Simoncast viewers need to hear what you say. Um, hi, uh, Reid. Thanks very much for the talk. I appreciate it very much. So I have a question. Uh, in your the grand question is the uh, petitioning of transpiration. Um, what's the vegetation treatment in the powerful? ground uh, CLM model is it dynamic vegetation or how does the prescribed vegetation and VS ground uh, dynamic vegetation does it make sensitive to the treatment in the ET transparent uh, petitioning yes okay so two questions as I understand it. the first question is what is the formulation um, and the formulation is um, basically it's a semental resistance type approach there is some dynamicism um, there's uh, you know, Monodobokov stability for the atmospheric partitioning and things like that. But there's, um, there is some dynamicism, dynamics in the, I was just going to make up a word on the spot there. There are some dynamics um, in the leaf area index that's, um, that's synoptic and that is prognostic, meaning it evolves. And it's basically based on a, on a not Bulberry. deep, but a, Bulberry? what's that? Is it no, it's, it's ballberry, but it's uh, it's also a um, a land surface temperature, a soil temperature that governs a min and max leaf area index. Now, in terms of the how much does that matter compared to say dynamic vegetation? That's a good question, and that's a little bit harder to sort of conjecture. But one of the reasons that I really like these controlled numerical experiments is I ran a perturbation with and without lateral flow but everything else. And yes, I'm saying that we have some confidence in the exact values, but we're not comparing the exact values of transpiration partitioning, just looking at the difference across those two numerical experiments. And so that is a way to say, okay, for the system, this is how much lateral groundwater flow changes your transpiration partitioning. And dynamic vegetation is one reason to say that, but the other is, well, we could go in and calibrate our vegetation parameters to get transpiration partitioning closer to 60%. And there's been studies that have done that. But that's not really mechanistic. And most of that is just changing the canopy area, right, which is kind of a linear component of that, of the three major components. And you're not really getting at a mechanistic change with those two. And so what you can say is, yes, dynamic vegetation probably would make a difference. But will it make more than 15%? Hard to say. Will it make more than a 15% difference? Not would it be plus or minus 15%? And so it's a great question. And I think it's also one of the reasons that I advocate running these numerical experiments so that we can understand the change in the system. Because it's a complicated system and there's a lot of reasons it may or may not you know, match data or respond. Thank you. Yes, uh, I, I really enjoyed the talk and love the idea of running these without calibration and then diagnosing what's going on, we enjoy that very much here. Um, going back on following on from this question, the rooting zone. Mm -hmm. uh, this has been a, uh, often a big struggle for our models. Uh, roots evolve over the growing season and they respond to drought and wet periods and things like that and they, and they tie into things that we hydrologists don't always understand well, such as mycorrhizal fungal networks and things like this and even linked like aspens pass it along and all that. Uh, how are you handling that in the model and has that been something that you've explored or played around with to uh, see how to represent it? Yes. Um, so 
in these experiments, the rooting depth is, is constant, so the roots do not evolve. And that's a, a really great point. That's another consideration. Um, and what we have done in my group and others, um, and I haven't, I've been collaborating with Gretchen Miller at Texas A&M, who has done a lot of work um, in the Tonzi CZO site, the actually not CZO, the Tonzi uh, LTER, Long-Term Ecological Research Site. And she has been, she and her students have been studying the hydraulic lift and plant water redistribution on groundwater ET components. And she's got a couple of nice papers out on that, one of, both using PARFLOW, but one that, that I'm on where we use modify CLM for that. And then, um, and then Mauro Solis, who is now at LIST, the Le Luxembourg Institute of Science and Technology, just came out with another really nice paper, um, also looking at plant water use strategies a little bit. We have done some um, work where we modify the plant water use strategy a little bit so that plants can be a little bit more opportunistic. Even if the root depth doesn't change, plants can change just hydraulically which root zone they pull from more or less. Um, but I think that's a really rich area of sort of exploration and collaboration. And I think that's, uh, you know, we've just sort of scratched the surface on this. And I think that there's a lot more that can be done. It's a really great point, really great question. Are there questions? Uh, yes. Uh, I would like to switch to just another kind of view. So I'm not actually have like hydro meteor background, but, but you mentioned about like the four quadrant and you evaluate the biases of your modeling. How can you tell you do not have like biases in like the observation, like there's a uh, snow tear, that kind of thing. Maybe there, um, the ground station might be based on like population or so. And that might, can guess. Some yeah, bias. I think that's actually a really good point. Um, I would say that I would think that probably the biases in the observations are smaller than the biases in the modeling system. But you're right, we don't know. Snowtail, snow um, there is some undercatch in Snowtail. Snowtail's not perfect. I think the snow pillows usually work pretty well. But they aren't put where the most snow happens. Obviously, they're put in places of opportunity. Um, and you know there could be uncertainty or errors in the rating curves on gauges. So yeah, all of these things you say are true. Um, and that is another important source of bias that I didn't show on that table. That's a great point. Yeah, uh, thanks, uh, Reed. Uh, sure. uh, thank you for your presentation. I see a great uh, maturation of power flow since I attended the present your presentation in uh, 2007, maybe, San Francisco. <laughs> wow. <laughs> And uh, yeah, my question, yeah, uh, my question is it regards the, uh, is there, s was there some coupling uh, with the transports like for the saturated, saturated groundwater and uh, to which extent if there is success like? Yes, uh, so um, Joe Beisman, one of my former PhD students who's now postdocing at Los Alamos National Laboratory, um, did his master's and his PhD on coupling par flow, um, not really coupling par flow tra to transport routines because what he did is he developed his own grid-based transport scheme within par flow um, that I think is actually in the version you can check out. And then he coupled first to uh, crunch flow, which is a geochemical kinetic reactive transport code. We just use the kinetics um, and then do our own transport, but it's fully coupled hydrology and reactive transport both for saturated groundwater and then for his, um, for his dissertation, he did this for uh, unsaturated processes as well. So fully coupled to the land service processes and everything. Um, and those papers are uh, in prep to in review. Um, and he's also extended that, and this is a shout out to the DOE Ideas Watersheds project, which is a model um, integration and coupling project. And so he coupled it into a geochemical coupling framework called Amanzi. Uh, sorry, al alchemia, which couples between a number of different codes, including crunch flow, par flow, Amanzi ATS, um, I believe also Freak C, so that users can really mix and match and say, you know what, I want to use the Freak C kinetics and the P flow tran transport, or I want to use par flow for land surface processes and crunch flow for kinetics or things like that. So that's a big active area of research in par flow right now. Thanks. Okay, our time is tight, but we have at least two more questions. I'll so answer quickly. That's my fault. Sorry. <laughs> so, um, 
When you put lateral flow into these models, in simple terms, you shed water from the upland and add water to the lowland. Mm -hmm. So that would presumably have spatially different effects on transpiration partitioning. Mm -hmm. C have you looked at validating this um, on a smaller scale than the continental US? Yes, and the number of times I've written that proposal with flux towers and a high and low water table depth areas, and the number of times it has been shot down by NSF. Um, so yeah, and I actually am surprised that nobody's done that yet, and I'm not necessarily the best you know, field person out there to do it, but I think this would be a really simple um, thing to do. There was a great paper um, that got at this. Um, it was, I'm blanking on the name of the authors. There were some Los Alamos, no, so there were some Pacific Northwest National Laboratory authors on it. Um, and they didn't quite have the highland lowland, but they had um, same site, two flux towers, two different water table depths, and they saw exactly this effect. Um, and then there's a uh, Joseph Zizlagi, his, I always butcher his last name, and Vitaly Zlotnik um, looked at this in the Nebraska Sandhills. Their paper was in groundwater a number of years ago, and they've seen the same relationship as well. So there's a few, but I think it, you know it's ripe for a lot more of just exactly this type of uh, of this type of um, observational experiment. Sure. Yeah, just make it quick. We are uh, over time. Sorry. Thank you for your presentation. I'm interested more in the human modeling part. So uh, your work actually rem reminded me of one uh, study in California by Megan Connor, uh, And they showed that uh, the groundwater was influenced by human water trade, not only by a local consumer, but also a global consumer. And I wanted to know that how your model can uh, struggle with kind of this kind of challenge because you also actually showed some kind of different uh, result during drought and after drought. So how can we interpret some kind of this challenge here? Sure, so there's not a quick answer to that, but I'm happy to like follow up in the, you know, the time after the presentation's over. But I think these are really great points. And so what I showed in that watershed is a tiny research, research watershed during the drought, and there's no or very little human intervention. Um, but human intervention is obviously really important because humans are going to pump more water. Humans are going to use water differently. There's going to be different water use, particularly for agriculture, during drought than when there's not drought conditions. And so this is something that we're working on. We've done some work in the Central Valley, um, particularly looking at um, groundwater pumping in the Central Valley. And I have a current PhD student, um, Lauren Thatch, who's working on that, and she has a paper that's in review uh, on exactly that topic, actually, in, in groundwater right now. And then um, we have a just funded, as of yesterday, a Food Energy Water Nexus grant that we're going to start looking at these things. So these are also great points. Okay, I'm mindful of time. Good thing is, so in about half an hour, we're going to be walking to Boffins for uh, some happy time with Reed. So if happy there's time. any questions or anything, yeah. Feel free to join us there, so everyone is welcome. Uh, and before I finish this, so next week we're going to have Bart Nyson from University of Washington. Make sure to be here at 3, 3 30 again on Wednesday. So join me in thanking Reed for coming here and the stimulating talk. Thank you very much.